Welcome out to another episode of It's All Been Turned. For this time, Aquiel. Yeah, it's not a brand of water. It's 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 the it's the main character in this episode. Aquiel. It's all been turned for a TNG episode. Aquiel. Uh, speaking of the, make us the main character. Like patreoncom slash IBD does not take much. Does not take much. Actually, you'll become the main character in our lives because we will love you so much. patreoncom slash IBD. Support us there, and you will be the star. And you keep us as the star, but really the star is Aquiel on It's All Been Trekked Before. Welcome out to another episode of It's All Been Trekked Before. A couple of your regular hosts are here. This is Steven. Jimmy Jerome, we are down to Keith this week, and most likely next, as we talk about the Star Trek The Next Generation episode, Aquiel. First impressions. This is one of those mystery ones, and, you know, I always talk about, well, it's mystery, and then it's revealed. And I, I didn't think the payoff was great necessarily in this one, but I, I thought there were enough interesting elements on the journey. I thought the journey was a lot better than the destination. So, yeah, I didn't love it, but as Jordy episodes go, I guess it was okay. Uh, it, it was, he, he wasn't as creepy as he was before. Yeah, no, nah, I didn't care for it. Uh, yeah. It, I read after I watched it, and already informed my opinion that the writers decided had said it was the weakest episode of the season. Mm. And I would tend to agree with that so far. We'll see yeah. when we get to the rankings, but it was, it wasn't terrible. It was just very forgettable. And yeah. a lot of, and there were a number of things that just rubbed me the wrong way about it. So I, I can't say I enjoyed it all that much. I got pretty bored. I think that's a fair assessment. <laughs> yeah. I didn't hate it, but it, like I said, there was enough to keep me engaged, but, there was nothing. I wrote a lot of notes, but I don't know that any of them. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll get into. Them, but the, yeah, yeah, I I don't have a lot of notes, but I, I did more for other episodes usually. Yeah, I mean, when you start off with a space dog, I wrote down space dog. Oh boy, <laughs> I knew we were in trouble right away. Well, I I uh, actually even before the dog started having warning signs because first of all, I thought the station looked a little bit like. Uh, original series station from the outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then when we got into it, I thought it looked a lot like the station where Carol Marcus worked in Star Trek 2, yes. Regula. I uh, thought it looked like Regula on the inside. Yes, and then is. we immediately like hear banging in the duct. And I'm like, well, Chekhov's in the duct, obviously. <laughs> Instead, it was a dog, but I assumed he still had worms because, you know, <laughs> they didn't check him for earworms, but since it's a dog, I assumed. That's well, pretty, pretty awful recasting a checkoff. If you ask me, I thought that was kind of disrespectful. And, you know, the entire episode, you knew the dog had more to do with it in some way. Somehow the dog was involved. Uh, oh, did you? I did not. Yeah, I knew it, it was Chekhov's dog. So, yeah. It, I mean, you put him where Chekhov was hiding, then it's got to be Chekhov's dog. <laughs> right. When they got Chekhov out, they must have left the dog in there all those years ago. Yeah, a cute dog. I, I couldn't tell... For a little while, it's like, does it have any? It, it reminded me of the dog that sadly dies in uh, the enemy within, but uh, much nicer and not with space things on top of it. But uh, again, cute dog, but I knew, oh boy, this is not. Well, the story. dog's name was Friday, and it has one other credit on IMDb. It was in an episode of Perfect Strangers ah. in 1987. That's what it's best known for. In fact, that's a little insulting. Known for, according to IMDb, Perfect Strangers. Just one thing at the top. It doesn't even have the Star Trek episode listed. Unbelievable. Ridiculous. We find the remains of Lieutenant Aquiel. And of course, they set this up as a mystery. I thought it was a little bit weird that they had to cut out the deck. Like, Crusher couldn't just run her scanner on it. Right. From there. Yeah. They can just leave a hole in the deck for everybody to fall in. <laughs> At least weld some guide rails around it or something if you're going right. to leave a hole. And so were they the only two on that station? Was it was that There small? were two officers and a dog. Okay. I, yeah. yeah, I guess maybe it makes sense, but I don't know. I, yeah. They kept mentioning the other officer's name. I already forgot it. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter. They're, they're a red herring anyway. They're just there to add to an unrelated clue to the mystery. Yeah. Jordy investigates Aquiel's quarters, which when he first does it, I'm like, okay, you send an away team with a handful of key personnel. The engineer mm -hmm. wanders into this room. Makes right. sense. The fact that he kept investigating in her quarters, like watching all the logs and everything, I'm like, isn't there an ensign you could assign to this? Yeah. Like, it does not seem like the best use of the chief engineer's time. You're right. That I mean, I think Jordy is one of the, you know, whenever we have a legal episode, he's a great investigator 
uh, no, but that's but you usually investigate an engineering mystery. This wasn't an engineering mystery. That's too, but uh, but yeah, I, I that's a valid point. And he part of it part of his investigation was to ask the dog, "What is it, pup?" As if it's Lassie, and the dog is going to tell him that, yeah, the, the Timmy's trapped in a well or whatever. So when he first walks into Aquiel's quarters mm -hmm. and sees the dog on the bed, we also get the shot of this blue and gold, like multicolor yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, first of all, is that the dog's collar? Cause it's super ugly and awkward and, and cumbersome. But then I thought, well, maybe it's just bondage gear. And you know, that, that's I, more understandable. Everything they, he picked up on her shelves. I wrote down, are these space dog bones or sex toys? And sure enough, eventually it ended up, that one thing was a sex toy. Uh, to me, it was a sex toy. <laughs> I mean, pretty much. You can use crystals for sex stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, my, my fashion notes were just the golden blue collar, as mentioned. And then that wig that she wore, that was oh, yeah. absolutely awful. My only fashion notes are from the end of the episode when they go to uh, 10, for 10 Forward. Mm. Uh, Jordy's green outfit. Eh, hard to pull off, but it was okay. And then she was in a very lovely dress. So... Finally, it's nice to see people out on the ship, not in their uniform. So I, I did appreciate that aspect. What did you think of the alien design they used for her? It was okay. It was, it was, uh... it felt like you've got two hours to come up with something. <laughs> yes. I was going to say lazy, but yeah. Uh, whereas, I mean, yeah. We're, we're more than halfway through the season. DS9's running and I, I'm pretty sure they shared some makeup people. So they may have just been too busy to do anything more. It may not have been laziness. It may I was going to say that because, <laughs> you know, I don't want to jump ahead, but next week's makeup, there's some great Deep Space makeup. Nine? Deep Space Nine, they, the makeup yeah. next week, I, I like a lot. But well, that's where they're spending all their effort. They're not coming back to next yeah, gen to do. Clearly. I mean, there's so many aliens in DS9. Yeah. I did enjoy the skylight over her bed, though. I would really like a skylight like that. Yeah. Like, just that big window. Big space light. Absolutely. When her picture comes up on the screen air quarters, Jordy does like, oh, take. Can he see photographs? I wouldn't think so. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Certainly not what she would look like in the photograph, right? Right. It'd be like a infrared kind of thing, right? It would just be like a blank square. Yeah. He must have really liked blank squares. <laughs> uh, my first thought was, okay, this is Leah Brahms 2.0. He's created this whole personality right. in his mind and relationship in his mind where she's not there. And, you know, the Orville did it too. Yeah. With, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 It, it, I mean, does. definitely, uh, what's his face on the Orville, the red hair helmsman? Um, He's the Geordie of their show. Scott Grimes' character. <laughs> Scott Grimes, yeah. He's the Geordie. And I feel bad. I can't remember his character's name. I no, I just Gordon? watched season three of the Orville. I should have it right at my fingertips. Like, Malloy, Gordon? Gordon Malloy. Gordon Malloy it is. There Gordon we go. Malloy. I got. We got there. Do you know this? She says something, and Jordy decides to rewind it to hear it again. And he, there's way more rewinding than you need to get back to the sentence <laughs> she just said. <laughs> I don't know what was going on there, but they did not match it. So when they're investigating, and Picard talks to Governor Torok, played by yeah. Wayne Grace. Best known for Mulholland Drive, Far and Away, Friday the 13th, The Final Chapter, and Volcano. He has 107 credits. So quite a few. Uh, he pull, was in, will be in an episode of Star Trek Enterprise as a different character. He's done some Star Wars video games and animated voices lately. He will, will play a different episode of DS9, different character in episode of Deep Space Nine, and also did some voices for uh, Star Trek video games. So lots of... Lots of that sci-fi stuff. And he was on Seinfeld. First time in a while we can say oh, that. I he was that. in the episode The Label Maker. He played Ukrainian. Okay. Yeah, I was about ready to give up even mentioning Seinfeld anymore, but there we go. Here we right are. Right there. So as Picard's talking to him, he plays the Galron card again. How many times can you play the Galron card? I wrote down. You don't do what I want. I'm going to call your chancellor. He's using his Klingon connections. And I, I like that it, maybe this points to the not so greatness of the episode they're like uh, i think it's picard says i'm following up on evidence so you're accusing me it's like no yeah. i'm just following up on evidence well and that's how klingons behave and i guess picard can yeah. to answer my own question i guess picard can play that gowron card as many times as he wants as long as he doesn't actually call gowron yeah i mean like it's a great bluff <laughs> right right he's put in the work colleen actually was in the room when i watched the shows for this week and next week she said and again, this is one of those things where she's not really watching, she's just listening. But when the Klingon signed off, she said, did they say block or plah? 
<laughs> Kerplunk. No. Which I thought was funny. And then, oh, this this is actually a little bit later in the episode, but our girl, our, our girl, Aquiel mentions, I think, dating a guy named Keith or something about a guy named Keith not being cool. And she uh, said she Yeah, she said she liked that in the future douchebags are called Keith. I said, well, that's one of our co-hosts. She's like, I know. <laughs> so she was just, she, that was for Keith specifically. So it's a bummer oh. he's not here, but that was just to, to, to poke fun at Keith. But oh, man. Uh, I enjoyed that though. <laughs> Before she shows up, Jordy's back in her quarters and he helps himself to the small thin pitcher that's on her desk and just pours himself a glass, uh-huh. which first of all, that's not practical at all. That pitcher makes like three little glasses. Mm-hmm. Second of all, it's been sitting out. You don't know what kind of dust and stuff has settled yeah. in there. You don't just drink an open pitcher sitting on the counter. And he's Didn't investigating. He that's evidence. Yeah, he should. And also, just what? It, that, that's not his property. I know that he thinks she's dead at that point, but right. seriously, just it does. It seems in poor taste all the way around. Mm. So then we find out she's alive, Lieutenant Aquiel Unari. Props for the name. I, I enjoy the name uh, because so m- many times the names are not as interesting. She's played by Renee Jones, who's best known for Days of Our Lives, Friday the 13th, Part 6. I feel like Friday the 13th is now becoming the reoccurring motif with guest stars. Yeah. Uh, the Bold and the Beautiful, and then this episode of Star Trek. She only has 41 credits, but she did over 1,800 episodes of Days of Our Lives. Yeah, she's been so there for 20 years. So Yeah, yeah that's good. probably where people know her from. Uh, and th- this was like smack dab in the middle. Actually, it was 30 years, Stephen, 1982 to 2012. Oh, wow. That's impressive. Yeah. So this was like in 10 years into that run. She, well, she and, took a break and did this. And maybe this points to my laziness in watching the episode in that I was surprised when she showed up. <laughs> I, w- I thought I was it was just going to be about her. You know this this person, and yeah, I was too. The, it was really weird when the Klingon, I guess, trying to posture was like she was in our space. She's lucky we didn't destroy the shuttle. And I'm like, you guys are allies. Right. Why would you destroy right. the shuttle? You would you would help her and bring her back like you did. Are you just talking? Because yeah, yeah, that surprised me too. I was like, wait a minute, aren't they kind of friends? Mm-hmm. Oh, I guess this is kind of fashion related in that same scene. And that same scene where the Klingons hand Aquiel back, Worf's forehead and ridges have a lot at more shading than usual. Uh-huh. It looked really bad. Yes. It looked like a uh, chocolate cake that, like, the fro- it had been frosted poorly or yeah. something. But, yeah, it was a lot darker than usual. It just wasn't That's good. Like, yeah. So right off the bat, she does not sound... You know, it's that thing of her not sounding convincing at all, you know, and I know. It, and then it, it's like, it's kind of that thing. And we've had this, I feel like one episode of season, it's that, well, I can't tell you. I'd love to tell you, but I can't. Or her, her whole thing is, well, I don't remember. But yeah, I, it's like, uh, that's not sounding real believable so far. Yeah, she, well, the memory loss, which ended up being genuine. Uh, right. Of course, really made her suspicious. And uh-huh. then she kept doing things that are suspicious just because she has a bad personality, apparently. <laughs> which she fully admits to. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, no, I've got a bad personality. I just don't get along with people. I kind of I, I kind of respect that the idea that she's just not she's prickly. Mm-hmm. People don't just don't, they don't get along with her. But not in a way that you enjoy watching. Because right. we enjoy plenty of prickly characters. That's true too. <laughs> She Jordy takes her to 10 forward because she doesn't want to be, you know, isolated anymore because she's been isolated. Because uh, even though she doesn't like people, she <laughs> wants to be around people, apparently. Uh, but they leave the dog in the quarters. And I'm like, should the, I, we, we don't see any dogs on the Enterprise. No, we don't. Data's cat's always in his quarters, <laughs> which makes sense because you don't like cats roam the Enterprise. Right. But I, I kind of feel like she would have been allowed to bring the dog to 10 forward, right? Do they have a no dogs sign on the outside ten four we've never seen? It seems like in the uh, yeah. I mean, these this day and age it seems like you can take your dogs almost anywhere. Yeah, it seems like she would have been able to. But. Jordy reveals to her that he essentially read her diary because apparently that's what those personal logs are. Uh, yeah, and I was gonna and I didn't write it down, but I was like, man, I guess diaries are still a thing in the twenty third and twenty fourth century. But I was like, wait a minute, of course they are because they introduce episodes and and. Coming out of Captain's every week. Yeah. yeah, so. I I thought it was 
out upstanding of him and everything to go ahead and admit that out front. I thought his reasons were perfectly logical. Like, hey, murder mm-hmm. investigation. We're looking for yeah. clues. This yeah. seemed relevant. Mm-hmm. All that makes sense. I felt like she got too upset about it and was too mean about it. I agree. Yeah, for once I thought, oh, Jordy actually wasn't creepy. I can see mm-hmm. why it would look like creepy behavior, but this time he actually wasn't creepy. Not yet. Now, wait, wait, yeah. wait, wait till later in the episode, when he, then he gets creepy. <laughs> yeah, now they're, they're calling him out right now, but it's like, nah, he, for, right now I know exactly. the creepy thing was him pouring from her little pink pitcher. Oh. That was the creepy <laughs> thing. Her shuttle is the Vern. Did you notice that? No. I assumed it after Jules Byrne, yeah. which at this point she was acting so suspicious. I was like, oh, is this a clue that her story is a work of fiction? Because her wow. shuttle is named after a fiction writer. That's good. Yeah. They call cellular residue cellular residue, which just made me think of finding DNA on the crime scene. And then later they call it DNA. I'm like, yeah. okay, yeah, this, this makes sense. And then for some reason, they found a suspicious amount of Jordy's DNA in her apartment. But <laughs> then we don't, we just move past that. We don't, we don't go into it. Uh, Jordy and Riker have that classic. <laughs> Uh, police chief to the detective scene you're uh, too close to the case yeah and uh, Riker's got a point Jordy should be yanked off the case immediately then <laughs> right yeah yeah I mean I think I think jo- what Jordy's saying is right like I think I wrote down Jordy knows his criminal law he knows you know but Riker's right I mean I think Riker's jumping to conclusions but I think Jordy's also like mm, take a couple steps back and see where Riker's coming from I wrote down because Riker comes in. He's like, well, this guy's got a spotless record and, and mm-hmm. this woman's known to be pushy. Yeah. And I was like, wait a minute. Believe her. He said, she said, you got to believe her, Riker. What are you doing? But Well, so- in those days, we don't have that. It's not the same issues we have now. They can judge you based on your own merits. Right. But today we have to believe. And, and that's the correct action. I I'm just saying there may be a point in the future where that extra context is no longer necessary yeah that yeah, would be that that evens nice. out that, this is a very uh yeah it's a very utopian future <laughs> yes i mean yeah but yes you're i think what riker's point is though is jordy very clearly displays his lack of objectivity and at the yeah. moment when she becomes a suspect he needs to be taken away off of it yeah and i thought it was almost like i thought they were going for it and they didn't they didn't leap far enough into it. Kind of, kind of a. I wish they'd gone all the way with that instead of where they ended up going. Kind of a noirish, like she's like the femme fatale, lady in trouble, and he can't help but fall for her. But even though he knows she's trouble, which is kind of what's going on, but it wasn't. I didn't feel like it was overriding enough, and she wasn't so much like, oh my god, she is dangerous. It was just more like she's annoying and trouble. <laughs> this is more what it was. I mean, not, but I mean, Renee Jones beautiful lady uh whatever and i'm sure she's engaging but aquiel is not (laughs) well it may not surprise you based on what you just said that this was loosely based on a 1944 film laura in which a detective investigating the murder of a woman named laura falls in love with her only discovered only to discover she's alive and may herself be a killer all right well i I guess i would i guess they did get through to me maybe they did do it enough but not enough to make me like it a lot enough to (laughs) I was in the story for this was by Jerry Taylor, who that doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, but then they gave the teleplay over to Ron Lee Moore and Ron and Raga, oh, yeah. who are two of Star Trek's best writers. Yeah. So Ron Moore said he really regretted writing this episode and just could not huh. break it. Right. Yeah. So like, even he is like, yeah, no, we screwed up. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this was bad. A valid point. And maybe this is what we've talked about before. Cause when I, I feel like when I brought this up, I was like, oh, man, how many episodes are we into this season kind of a thing? And they've still got this many more. I think it was, whatever, 23 or 24 episodes, or maybe it's 26 in this season. I was like, oh, man, so many. And then I was like, so maybe this is one of those where like, well, we, we just needed to get this down on paper. Yeah. It was directed by Cliff, Cliff Ball, one of the regulars. I'll forget gotcha. to say it if I don't say it now. Gotcha. <laughs> As, as they're investigating Aquiel, she does herself no favors whatsoever. Nope. Like, she does not even try to help them. And then she kisses Jordy, which mm-hmm. is like, like, she's tainting the investigation even more. <laughs> so. Yeah, I wrote, like, he's like, well, this could complicate. When you kiss the kisser, that complicates things. Yep. 
we get to the sick bay and all of a sudden we get a creepy hand duplicate of Dr. Crusher's hand in the, yeah. the gel. I mean, uh, setting aside all the obvious adult jokes of uh, why you might want to well, grow a hand in your... I stuff. have one. <laughs> yeah, okay. I wrote one down. Go ahead. Uh, when Picard comes in and she's like, yeah, that's my hand, blah, blah, blah. The way he looks at it is just like, hmm, the possibilities. <laughs> He's like, oh, I'll dispose of this for you. Don't worry, I'll take it. I'll take it back to him. Yeah, I like, yeah, that's exactly what I thought. So, yeah. <laughs> they called it a coalescent organism. I believe mm -hmm. I'm saying it correctly. Yes, I, yep. Okay. What I wrote, my tomato soup has a hand in it. Waiter, yeah. oh, waiter, my tomato soup has a hand in it. So then, of course, we're wondering who was absorbed by the, the right. organism. And Jordy's back with the crystal doing adult things in her quarters. She's <laughs> growing hands for him. You know, it's just. Yeah, I thought this was a, and I thought that was going to be like a, the game thing or whatever, where she absorbs. She's mm -hmm. the bad guy and she's absorbing his spirit or whatever. That would have felt very like an original series episode if that were the case i i i never did write it down but i thought eventually we were going to see what what Aquiel really was and it was gonna be like the man trap she was a salt vampire yeah that's yeah this is a remake though. of the man trap seriously but i'm, I'm an inferior remake of the man trap for that matter <laughs> yeah you might be right there i think you're right so they kind of arrest sort of arrest take into custody Aquiel. And the whole time they're like taking her into custody and Jordy's in the quarters and he's upset about it. The dog is right there. Like right, right on screen. At that point, it's you were blaring klaxons of <laughs> look at the dog, look at the dog. And then he melts into something that is definitely not Odo. Again, the budget's <laughs> going to Deep Space Nine. Uh. <laughs> how interesting would it would it have been more interesting given how they like tried to tie a few things to ds9 right around this time with mm. the cardassians and stuff if it was another member of odo's species instead of just a coalesced organism yeah not, yeah that, that would have made more sense more yeah for tying things together and i will i should i could save this for when we're doing ds9 but i'll say it now while we're talking about shapeshifters or whatever so far every every time odo is a shape and comes Turns back into Odo. I'm surprised every time. Like, oh my god! <laughs> oh wait, what? Oh, okay. That oh, that's right. He's a shapeshifter, but which is good. I think it's good. I'm still surprised. But. When the organism attacks Jordy, it yeah. sure felt like they were just going through the exact same motions of the story we already heard of what happened on the station. Yeah. Except that he'd have to fire his phaser for anywhere near 30 or 40 seconds, likely just because that would have been too much time for the pacing. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, I wrote, I think that's where I wrote the phaser set to kill. It's like, yeah, so, turn it up. So why not just make it a plot point you had to fire for seven seconds, which is unusually long, <laughs> instead of making a point to say 30 or 40, which then you get to the moment and you, you're not going to have them do. Yeah, because, I mean, I guess the original series, phaser blast usually, well, I don't know. Uh, pew, uh, pew. The apply, but, but yeah, they're usually, choo, choo, yeah, the, I mean, it's, sometimes they're extended, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's like, a very good point. Yeah, unnecessary plot hole. <laughs> Yes, I wrote down Klingons never say, well, here's my alibi, you know, <laughs> here's, here was a, they just say, this is outrageous, and they walk out. So That's very typical of what we see in the species, not to be is. specious. Yeah, it is. Now, yeah. the, the Klingon you're talking about, Morag, who was the suspect, yeah. was played by the great Reg E. Cathy, mm -hmm. who died in 2018. Yeah. He was best known for the 2015 Fantastic Four, The Mask, SWAT, um, you remember, may remember him from Luke Cage. Uh, House of Cards. Great actor. I love him. Yeah. Sadly, hidden under the makeup, I couldn't really see what was going mm -hmm. it, it did not feel like him to me. Like, just did not uh, get the Reggie Kathy moment. But cool that he was in it. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I didn't know that was him either until I, I just looked it up just before we started. And I guess this goes for not just start this episode of The Next Generation, but for maybe the world in general, but also TV, movies, whatever. When two people don't get along and one of them dies, should that make somebody a suspect? I mean, in this instance, they're the only two people. There's a phaser. She disappeared and all that. That definitely makes her... Mm -hmm. If you throw in all those elements, that makes her a suspect. But in this instance, it felt like they were like, well, you guys didn't get along. And, and you know, I don't know if she should have... She shouldn't have to say, well, we didn't get along, but I didn't want to kill him. I feel like they need to find more of an alibi than we didn't get along. 
more of a reason to suspect her, yeah, because like yeah, yeah, Riker doesn't like everybody on the ship. You're not right. gonna suspect him, yeah, right, yeah. So I'm not sure when I wrote this down. I just wrote down stupid. Oh, it was when the dog was pulling on uh, Jordy's pant leg. I think yeah, I down stupid dog. And then my last note of the episode, and I'm pretty sure this is correct. We'll never see her again. So you are correct. They they have this whole conversation about how she's leaving, even though Jordy offers to pull some strings mm. that she wants to come back. Don't be surprised if you see me again. I did a little, a small amount of research, pull it, yeah. putting on my Steven hat. <laughs> and apparently they were trying to make her a reoccurring character. They had uh, planned to bring her back. That's why they left it open-ended like that. But the utter lack of chemistry between the two just sunk it because <laughs> they're like, this isn't going to work. But apparently there was a lot of talk after O'Brien and Keiko transferred to Deep Space Nine of we don't have any couples on this show. We should really see a couple again. Right. Wouldn't be nice if we had a reoccurring love interest mm. for Jordy. So that was the thinking behind it. It just did not work when they did it. They did mention that they will try. I mean, we've got another couple coming up and DS9 has couples in it. So we'll, we'll get more. They'll get there. Just I'm trying to not think of the ensign we loved that I felt like they had a little bit of chemistry and then they just... They Sonia Gomez? Not. Yes, that's who I'm thinking yeah. of. And, but they're like, eh, nah. I know there's some other stuff going on there too. But. You could have had Worf and Kalar, but you killed Kalar off. Dumb decision. Yep. yep. Or just go there with Riker and Troy. We all want it anyway. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, Which I think Colleen said something along those lines uh, during this episode, I think, actually. I mean, not to spoiler, I, I think feel like this has already kind of been hinted, but mm. what they're going to do instead of Riker and Troy is Troy and Worf, which makes right. no sense to me. Right. It's like, why? When you've got Riker right there, did you think you were going to run another three seasons and you needed to draw it out? I think what Colleen said was, isn't it okay for them to have sex on a starship? I'm like, well, I can tell you that guy is having sex with everybody. Yeah. So The Parsec yeah. High Club. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're all they're all members. <laughs> alternate uh, episode, I guess my alternate episode would be you cast an actress that actually has some ke- some uh, chemistry with Lavar Burton. Yeah, and I would love to see Jordy in a regular relationship. Mm-hmm. That would be great. Mm-hmm. If any character deserves it, it's him. Mine was CSI Enterprise, so it's more of like every week, or I guess I mean at least this week. I mean, I guess that's kind of what they did, but not exactly. So. We see the, and I, I'm going back to early CSI. Maybe they still do this. I haven't watched an episode of CSI lately where they go into the mind of the killer or into the, they're trying, you know, I, I, when they try to recreate it every episode, like we think this could have happened or it could have been this yeah. or that. But um, so that would have been, that would have been mine. I, I think that might've been more, more interesting as it turns out. So. Who was your annoyance? Is Riker just for his, uh, I thought he was over the top of his investigation. I could have gone Jordy, but I went Riker. I thought one of them, if one of them would have been just a little more like, oh yeah, I see where you're coming from. Then you don't even need to do that part. They're act- then they're actually working together instead of against each other. But so, yeah, it's Riker. I'm going with Jorquiel because they both just, <laughs> the whole thing, both individually and, and together. That's good. Annoying. Uh, that's, a solid choice. That's definitely their couple name, too. Jorquiel. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you going to have a drink with? Uh, Aquiel, just so I can try this musk and seed punch she's talking about. It's It's got alcohol in it, right? Or doesn't it? I wasn't clear. You know, I, I thought that's I, what Jordy was drinking in her quarters at first, but then they never confirmed that. So now I don't think it was. I went to look it up, but then um, I read it real too quick. And I was like, oh, it's Hawaiian. It's like, no. It's halal. It's you know whatever her her species yeah. is. So again, Renee Jones, very beautiful woman. But yeah, I don't know if I'd want to hang out with Aquiel that much. I guess if there was alcohol in the musk and seed punch, it would make it a lot easier. So that's who I want. You know, if they had cast Renee Elise Goldsberry, I feel like it would have worked better. Yeah, I yeah. know she wasn't really like big then. Uh-huh. She was you know only like twenty years old, but I I feel like it would have worked better if they needed a Renee. Cast a different Renee is what I'm saying. Yeah, I wrote down for my drink Riker, and I don't remember why. <laughs> Maybe just because Jordy was awful to him, and right. he did the right thing. And he's the hard, heavy police captain that's going to need a drink after this day. I don't know. Ranking the episode, can we start at the bottom? Yeah, I, I know you want to get down. 
And and I yeah, I think you've made me dislike this episode more as well. But well, let's I mean, see. Dislike might be strong. Just so. let let's see what's at the bottom and see if yeah. we dislike this more. Because the bottom right now is schisms. Ooh, that was pretty bad. I don't feel like I can argue strongly one way or the other. <laughs> I feel like that one may be slightly worse, except that it's more watchable, because at least it's not as boring as this one. Yeah, I'm going to go above. <laughs> okay. I guess I, I'm really having trouble deciding. Above that's Time's Arrow Part 2, which I know wasn't good, yeah, but I still liked I, it more than this. I think you're right. Yeah, I, I sure as heck cannot make an impassioned plea. For it. Okay, so we'll put it second from the bottom above schisms are we about halfway through the season is that where we are this was episode 13 so 26 we're exactly halfway okay next week we're going back to deep space nine for an episode called captive pursuit for the first time an alien comes from the other side of the wormhole he has ship trouble and seems very reluctant to accept any help chief o'brien quickly finds out he has a secret uh at least aquiel did have a good title captive pursuit sounds like a generic Cinemax movie or a generic Skinemax movie. Either way, what a generic yeah. title. Yeah. Until then, live long. Do not trust dogs and prosper. That's why I'm a cat person. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs>